From the heart of the jungle comes a savage cry of victory. This is Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. From the black core of dark Africa, land of enchantment, mystery, and violence, comes one of the most colorful figures of all time, transcribed from the immortal pen of Edgar Rice Burroughs, Tarzan, the bronzed white son of the jungle. And now on the very words of Mr. Burroughs, the story of Rays of Death. Many, many times in the past, the coming of the white man, his machinery and his guns and his cruelties, had brought death and destruction to Tarzan's jungle. And so, perhaps it was fortunate that the activities of the jungle lord kept him hundreds of miles away from the base of isolated Kiabo Mountain during the construction of TSEM-1. The huge windowless buildings of solid brick would have aroused his curiosity. The enormous corral with its high steel fencing and electrified guard wire would have instilled anger in him. And could he possibly have guessed at the purpose of TSEM-1, the aboriginal fury that civilization had changed but little would have surged within him. How much longer, Ursley? How much longer? And we've not too much more construction work to do, sir. When they lower that last boulder into place, the confinement area for the animals will be completed. And high time. We've got to move faster, Ursley. That's all there is to it. Mr. Forbes Martin, I've worked the clock round. My staff has done likewise. And of the hundred native workers Captain Lawrence lined up, there's not one man who's done less than his best. You can't ask fairer than that. Well, I suppose not. But I'm extremely worried about those natives. Inasmuch as they're skilled workers, they're a cut above the average. And a man who thinks is bound to start asking questions in time. Oh, that's true in a measure, I suppose. Uh, I certainly wish we could get rid of them. Well, most of the heavy manual labor's about done. I suppose that if it were really necessary, my men could polish off what's still... Uh, excellent, Ursley. I knew you'd come up with an answer. Now, 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 where's that military fellow? Well, Captain Lawrence? Oh, he's right over there by the crane a moment ago. Lawrence! Captain Lawrence! Oh, here he comes, sir. Oh, you wanted to see me, Mr. Forbes Martin? How long will it take you to round up your friends, the natives, eh? Oh, scarcely a minute, sir. I'm glad you appreciate how hard they've been working and have decided to let them knock off a little early for once. Oh, you misunderstood, Mr. Forbes Martin, Captain Lawrence. He wants them to knock off for good and go back to wherever you found them. But I promised them three months' work, and so far they've only been here. Our need for them is past. And I want them taken out of here tonight. They're to be blindfolded, as they were when they came. They're to be returned to their natural habitat by a circuitous route. And before you turn them loose, you must be sure that none of them has the remotest idea of where he's been. Must we continue to play cops and robbers, Mr. Forbes Martin? I was told you'd been instructed to carry out my orders. And I shall have to insist that these matters be taken care of in my way. Very well, sir. Leslie, I may need some help in fetching the men you sent over to work in Ghost City. Anything I can do, Lawrence. And we'd best get a move on, I suppose. Right, oh, we haven't much time. Uh, Lawrence! Yes, Mr. Forbes Martin? You probably feel that my inflexible treatment of Ursley's staff and of your natives is possible only because I've avoided personal contact with them. Well, sir, there's no foundation to such a belief. Were my own nine-year-old son here in Africa instead of being at home with his mother, and if his presence or knowledge of our project jeopardized our secrecy, I wouldn't hesitate a second at a choice between the successful fulfillment of TSEM-1 and his life. Yes, Tarzan would have been angered at the encroachment that the unyielding Albert Edward Philip Forbes Martin and his men were making on his jungle. And his bronzed face would have paled to hear a man put the secrecy of some mysterious project above the life of his own son. But Tarzan was in the strange native port of Michidarin. He was several hours early for the appointment that had brought him to the coastal city, and he strolled casually along the rustic wharf, gazing at the latine sail de house that dotted the harbor, the outriggered fishing canoes dumping their catch into enormous cane baskets, and an unidentified cargo ship that was beginning to unload on the pier. Watch out, boy! Watch out! That crate is... What is... 
sorry I had to grab you that way, young man, but you didn't see that crate falling. It, it, it just missed me, didn't it, sir? By inches. But I wasn't frightened. I didn't cry out. Tell me I didn't, sir. You were as, as brave as Numa the lion. I'm really extraordinary courageous, even though my father says I'm a mollycoddle. You must be frightfully strong to have lifted me right off the ground the way you did. <laughs> Well, it, it uh, yes, it was quite a strain. You must weigh all of 65 pounds. I, I'm not sure about pounds, sir. I weighed a little over five stone when I left, uh, when I left home. You were about to say when I left England. Why, why did you stop? No one's supposed to know that we came from England, sir. That's why we fly no flag. How did you guess I was English? Are you English, sir? Uh, my parents were. What's your name? I'm called Tarzan. And you? I'm called Bertie, but I'd much rather be known as Spike or Butch or something like that. My real name's Albert Edward Philip Forbes Martin. It's a big name for a small boy. What brings you to Africa aboard a cargo ship, Albert Edward Philip Forbes Martin? I mustn't say, sir. My father's in the jungle doing something that nobody must know anything about. He'll be angry enough when he finds out I know where he is and what he's up to. Tarzan's strange conversation with the English lad came to an abrupt end when angry voices recalled the youth to the ship. Tarzan attributed the boy's melodramatic words to an overactive imagination and then turned his attention to the hundreds of crates and cartons that poured from the vessel. Many of them, when struck with a bronzed fist, appeared curiously empty. And they all bore the same stencil, T-S-E-M-1. There was no address. But even this enigma was put aside as Tarzan made his way through the exotic port of Michidarin to the imposing building labeled International Trading Corporation. I have uh, waited impatiently for our meeting, Tarzan. No more so than I, Mr. Grebel. There are not many messages that would bring me over thousands of miles of jungle, but your runner said that all of Africa was threatened. Quite so. Somewhere in the inner Congo, a man is building a mighty stronghold. He has many accomplices with him, and uh, their objective is to kill or destroy everything on the dark continent. And I am to put a halt to such a scheme? <laughs> Not single-handed, surely. But if you can provide us with a map indicating where the stronghold is located, my company will provide men and uh, whatever else is necessary to put an end to this diabolical plan. Mr. Grebel, you will have to forgive me if I'm skeptical, but I, I know little except that your company is new here and that until recently you were a stranger to our shores. Why are you so concerned over Africa's future? Uh, quite frankly, we have invested a great deal of money in founding this company for the export of pelts. We are doing well and have even erected the warehouse and the tannery you might have noticed to the rear of this building. If the scheme of these men succeeds, our investment and future profits will be eliminated. <laughs> At last I've met a man who's honest. You have admitted that your only interest in Africa is money. Had you preached some noble cause, I, I might have doubted you. Well, your motive is unimportant. If Africa is in danger, I will do what I can. What uh, do you know about these men? Uh, their leaders are English by birth, but they owe their allegiance to a different foreign power. They have great wealth behind them and receive uh, tons of material. But it's absolutely impossible to trace the safaris that leave here with the goods. Well, why is it not a simple task to follow these safaris? Because sometimes as many as ten safaris leave at once, all traveling in different directions. We haven't enough trained jungle scouts to follow them all. It would be unnecessary to follow those caravans that carry the empty crates. What? I was on the wharf and became suspicious of the weight one small cargo ship could carry. I was also fortunate in securing another trail marker as well. I think I can safely promise you that I will follow the right safari. And I give you my word that I will provide you with a map. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, we've got the last of the animals into the enclosure, Mr. Forbes Martin. And the native bearers who drove them into the corral? Some of Lawrence's men led them back through the pass, and they'll be escorted to within a mile of their village before the blindfolds are removed. <laughs> then we'll select a powerful rhino and a giant ape for the first of our experiments. And we'll proceed as soon as the next shipment arrives. It uh, should have reached uh, Michadari in uh, 12 days ago. Oh, it did, sir. And the safari's rolling in right now. Captain Lawrence said he'd report to... Uh, come in. Good afternoon, sir. Confound it, Lawrence. You're... You've already said good afternoon to me twice today. What are you stalling for? What's wrong? Are some of the items I've been waiting for missing from the shipment? Uh, no, sir. Everything you expected has arrived, but... Uh... But I'm afraid one small item that you didn't expect also arrived. Tarzan watched the arrival of the safari from the concealment of a high tree, but he made no move against the intruders who had erected this strange settlement at the foot of Kiabo Mountain. First, he must convince himself of the truth of Griebel's charges. The proof was not long in coming. As the sun descended, the shaft of lightning reached out from the windowless building, and several miles away in the ghost city, a stone wall crumbled. Later, the luminous finger struck down a rampaging ape and a gargantuan rhino who had been set free only to be killed without uttering a sound. Tarzan was satisfied with the proof. And so, in a different way, was Albert Forbes Martin. Yes, these preliminary tests are most encouraging, Earthly. Tomorrow night, we shall see what we can do with a large herd of animals. And in a week or so, We'll try our hand with the entire ghost city. My men are working late, tabulating the findings. Will there be anything else, sir? Uh, Lawrence is outside with the boy. Yes, sir. Send him in. All right, sir. Lawrence. Yes? And Mr. Forbes Martin's ready to see the boy. Good night, sir. Congratulations on your good luck with the experiment. No, not luck, Ursley. Determination of purpose. A grim conviction that nothing must impede TSEM-1. The boy, sir. Thank you, Captain. Uh, no, 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 don't go. I want you to hear this, lest any of you think the words I spoke one day were in jest. I never thought that for a moment, sir. <laughs> After all, I can't expect less from myself than I do from my subordinates. Aren't you even going to say hello to me, Father? I'm going to say a great deal more than that, Bertie. I waited until my work was done for the day. And now I'm ready for you to tell me how and why you came here. Well, sir, I wanted to come to Africa and fight animals and... Well, things like that, sir, to prove that I wasn't a mollycoddle. Who said you were? You did, sir, the day you left, and you needn't deny it. Very well, I did then. Get on with your story. Well, after you'd gone, I sort of got in the habit of going down to the Keys. Finally, one day, I saw some crates and things marked T-S-E-M-1. And I knew they were intended for you. How? I, I saw some papers on your desk before you left home, sir. A saboteur right in the bosom of my own family. <clears throat> really, sir, I, I think you should talk to the boy alone, and I'm... I said stay. What was your next move, Bertie? Well, I, I found out that the ship carrying the cargo was leaving the next morning, so I packed some togs and left before anyone in the house was awake. I, I boarded the ship, sir, and I persuaded Captain Bonzer to take me along. Captain Bonzer's not a man who's easily persuaded. How did you manage it, Bertie? I, I blackmailed him, sir. I said that if he didn't take me, I'd tell his destination to some men I'd seen on the wharf. They seemed frightfully anxious to find out. Then Bonzer did well to get you out of their way. Did he let your mother know where you were? Not until we got out to sea. Then he sent a wireless saying that I'd stowed away. He said you could clear things up later and that it bloody well served you right for saying I was a mollycoddle. <laughs> this is no laughing matter, Lawrence. <clears throat> Did anyone else know of your destination? No, sir. Then for the present, I shall withhold punishment. You will remain in the building where you were confined this afternoon until my work in the jungle is completed. And you'll talk to no one. Meals will be brought to you regularly, and we'll put a cot in there. You may thank your lucky stars you're getting off as easily. The animals, sir, they're escaping. Gunsman, get your gun. I need those animals. I don't want them shot. Lives come first, Mr. Forbes Martin. Fire when ready, man.
Well, most of the animals streaked off into the jungle. For a minute, I thought they were going to have a go at all of us. Ah, days lost, weeks perhaps. Better than having had a few of our men killed, sir. And it wasn't very sporting to keep all those animals hemmed in. So you felt sorry for the poor animals. And instead of remaining in your building this afternoon, you sneaked out and opened the gate. Oh, I hardly think Bertie liberated them, sir. There are half a dozen gaping holes in the fence. Two of the boulders were moved. Would have taken several men of fantastic strength. Well, there goes the last of our captives. I think I know who set the animals free, Mr. Forbes Martin. That cry was made by a man named Tarzan. What? One man ripped our steel fencing and moved those boulders? He's frightfully strong, sir. And just what do you know about this Tarzan, Bertie? Uh, I met him on the dock at, at the Mikadarin. So you did tell someone else about your destination? All I said to him And was... he followed you here. Captain Lawrence, I want Bertie arrested for treason. And once you've relayed my command to your men, I want you to go after Tarzan. <laughs> We'll return to our story, Rays of Death, in just a moment. No power on earth could have persuaded Captain Lawrence to lead soldiers in pursuit of Tarzan. For long had the jungle lord been his friend. So he searched alone, braving the dangers of the Congo, plunging into the depths of Tarzan's familiar haunts, chasing an elusive shadow until he was near exhaustion. Oh, I guess I'd better have a bit of rest here before I turn back. You would have been better off giving up the search before you began. Tarzan, How could you have allied yourself with a man like Forbes Martin? Well, I have no liking for the man personally, but he is a brilliant scientist and a great patriot. <laughs> great patriots do not hide themselves in remote corners of the jungle. Nor do they build windowless houses and erect electrified guardrails. Neither do they blindfold their workers and select only those who do not understand their tongue. Yes, I've learned these things about Forbes Martin. And to me, they spell a man who's bent on evil. They could also indicate the extreme importance of TSEM-1. Mm, another sign. Why does the man use a secret symbol? It stands for Top Secret Experimental Mission Number One. Number One, Tarzan. Our government's most important attempt to stem the destruction of a democratic world. This is to be achieved by capturing and killing animals and by destroying parts of an abandoned city where other selfish men once attempted to rob the jungle. The city once built for the oil workers affords a good target for Forbes Martin's new weapon. And so does the abundant wildlife. Buildings not already tested against the ravages of jungle elements would have been useless. Likewise, guinea pigs in a city laboratory. He has discovered a new means of death, huh? You should be proud of knowing such an accomplished miracle worker. I also hate to see animals die and property destroyed. But if it's in the interest of peace... Well... Would a man interested in peace and understanding put his own son behind bars? Forbes Martin blames the boy for leading you here. You may tell the genius that Tarzan can follow the trail of a safari without help. That bearers carrying heavy crates leave a different impression on the soil than those bearing empty ones. Hmm. I wish you'd tell that to Forbes Martin. I shall return to his fortress. But not until I've been to Michadarin to fulfill a promise. A promise? A gentleman there is anxious to know the location of Forbes Martin's death factory. And I gave my word that I would furnish a map. Believe me, those who would block Forbes Martin's work are those who would destroy not animals or buildings, but men's souls. If you deliver a map to this man, I'll hunt you down with a full regiment of trained jungle fighters. And so help me, I'll have you tried for treason. Bertie. Yes, Captain Bertie. Lawrence. Oh. Now listen carefully. I haven't much time. Yes, sir. I fear for your life. Due to Tarzan's influence, I can't get a beater to work for us here. And regardless of what I say, your father blames you. I know he does, sir. I'd hoped Tarzan would have returned by now and helped clear you, but perhaps he doesn't intend to return. Well, regardless of the consequences, I've got to get you out of here. I'm ready to go, sir. Now, crouch low and streak for the brush over there. 
I'll wait to see you on the clear, and then I'll meet you there. Very well, sir. Don't be long. I won't be. Lawrence! Captain Lawrence! Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Coming right up, sir. What were you doing in that building? Oh, I... Just checking up on our prisoners, eh? Uh, you have other matters more urgent. I want you to get all, all your men together. Surround the laboratory. Round up every last one of them. Well, well, get cracking. Go after the men standing guard duty at the pass first. Quickly now, Lawrence. On the top. Yes, sir. The men at the pass first. Ursley. Yes, Mr. Forbes Martin. I'm going up the mountain to stretch to observe the effectiveness of the bolt ray. At 1,200 hours, you will set it off. 1,200 hours on the nose, sir. How much start did the boy have, Captain Lawrence? It was over an hour before I got back. When I saw that leaf move, I thought it was he. And for a moment, I thought you were he. <laughs> Heaven knows what may have happened to him by now. Well, I'm sure we're on the right track. Boys love to climb mountains. There was a trail leading from his prison to the fringe of brush, and when I found the boy gone, I followed it. But a bit over five stone doesn't leave much of an impression on sun-hardened clay. Did you hear that? A twig snapping up the mountain just a short way. Come on. Well, thank heavens we found him in time. I'm not sure. It sounded like a what heavier... What do you mean, want? Uh, uh, we're searching for Bertie. He escaped? Well, in a way. And he's roaming around the jungle somewhere. Oh, oh look. Look, straight down the, the ghost city. Do you see something moving there? Uh, not from this distance, It's impossible no. to it's see him. It's our little explorer. I can get down there in about 20 minutes. Oh, forgive me for my sins. Lord Martin, what's wrong? Regardless of the purpose... I'll never touch an instrument of death again so long as I live. What are you getting at? In exactly ten minutes, Ursley will touch a radio contact and the ghost city will disappear like a puff of smoke. As Captain Lawrence restrained the distraught father, Tarzan swung into the upper level and streaked toward the ghost city in a race against death. The boys and perhaps his own. Never before had the jungle lord traveled as miraculously fast, hardly touching one tree before he was in the next, his legs pounding like steel pistons as he left the forest and spurted across the clearing to the ghost city. Hurdling a high wall, his eyes darted everywhere, and he seemed hardly to pause at all as he scooped up a small item of humanity, vaulted over a rusted oil pump, and dashed toward the protection of the jungle. The seconds were ticking by, and he was not yet... since forgotten that you called me a mollycoddle, sir. Africa makes a man more tolerant. Perhaps you're right, son. Tarzan, you were magnificent. But painful as it is, we have a great deal to settle if you delivered that map to an enemy agent. I did. Uh, Captain Lawrence, uh, couldn't we overlook that? I delivered a map. Well, that's what I promised. Your soldiers, Captain Lawrence, will undoubtedly find Grebel and his men where my map led them, to the other side of the mountain. My ears were convinced of Grebel's honesty, but my nose knew him to be a liar. Your nose? Just as Mr. Forbes Martin used decoy safaris, Grebel used a decoy tannery. A building that houses an espionage staff does not produce the same odor as one used to cure hides. <laughs> Now, a strange woman she was, gentle in appearance and mild in manner, until she witnessed the spectacle of man's cruelties against animals and each other. And then the thrill that makes men applaud bloodshed at a boxing match infected her soul. Tarzan encounters her and an unknown species of animal more deadly than any he has ever battled 
in Tarzan and the Lipagore. Tarzan, a transcribed creation of the famous Edgar Rice Burroughs, is produced by Walter White, Jr., prepared for radio by Bud Lesser, with original music by Albert Glasser. This is a Commodore production.